I'm basically the warm-up act for Chal, so I'm going to get on with my bit of the presentation, which is talking about, about DHI and, and the kind of high-level strategic um, uh, uh, environment that we see. And then Chal is going to actually get into to more of the detail and I think hopefully challenge some of your thinking, uh, but also uh, hopefully um, present some things that you recognize uh, as we go through the next uh, hour together. So first of all, um, if I can um, just share this picture with you. Uh, this is uh, our office. The reason I sure share it is we haven't been in that building since March of last year because of the COVID pandemic. We're based in the center of Glasgow. Uh, we are Scotland's National Innovation Center for Digital Health and Care. We are funded by Scottish government, um, but we're independent of the public sector. We are hosted uh, by an academic institution, the University of Strathclyde, uh, although we are not uh, an academic department. So you could say we've got the best of both worlds in that we inform and um, actually uh, write some government policy and then are tasked with uh, implementing uh, some of it. Uh, but you could say we've also got the worst uh, of both worlds where we are um, thought to be in the inside, but we are on the outside and we don't have any firm and solid levers to pull to affect change. So it all has to be done by influencing coherent argument uh, or, or should we say unashamed manipulation. And this is our world. We were just talking about it before um, uh, you all joined us. Uh, the COVID pandemic has uh, been transformational within our lifetime. Um, it has been one of the most wicked viruses I think we've ever experienced, um, appears benign, and in some cases is incredibly benign, uh, but in others uh, can be a, a wicked killer, uh, and we believe create significant um, morbidity uh, for others, um, with no a hard and fast rule, uh, who is going to be affected in what way, but it's influenced all aspects of our lives, um, both negatively and in some cases when it comes to the use of digital tools and services, um, positively. For example, who would have thought that certainly in the UK, uh, we'd be celebrating uh, birthdays, anniversaries with our families uh, using technologies like this? Who would have thought but in Scotland, we would be uh, ordering a Michelin star meal from a West End restaurant in London and having it delivered within 40 hours to your doorstep to enjoy in the comfort of your own home. We would never have thought that that was going to happen, but it does on a day to day basis. So digital technologies and the way we access services is now ubiquitous uh, within our uh, personal and private lives. Still less so within uh, uh, the world of health and care that we, we all inhabit. But what I want to bring us back to is the reality that, in fact, uh, the problems that we were trying to address before the COVID pandemic appeared are clear and present today. The fact we've got the inexorable rise of aging populations around the world, the increasing rise of long-term conditions, the fact that percentage of gross domestic product being consumed by health and care has been increasing exponentially, both in the developed world, but also in the global south. And that is not sustainable. It wasn't sustainable in the medium and long term before COVID, and it's certainly not sustainable even in the short term, now with the challenges that we're facing in most health and care systems. But as immunization comes along and we begin to emerge from this, um, it's not simply that vaccination is going to solve all our problems and we can go back to living life the way we were living them before. Um, that isn't going to be an option for us. So what uh, is the future going to look like in a world that is now increasingly connected, is increasingly using digital technologies, as I said earlier, in day-to-day -day life, as technology continues to advance, as connectivity is being driven forward in remote and rural, rural areas. There are still significant challenges and there are still challenges between those who have and those who have not. And colleagues on this call will all have seen the most recent Lancet article, which has now been endorsed by WHO. I was speaking to the chief scientist just last week 
and they do recognise that um, digital inclusion um, is going to be an increasing social determinant uh, of health uh, as we move forward. So as we think digital, what do we mean by that? And in DHI, uh, what we uh, continually talk about are next generation digital services. We are not simply in the business, as a lot of people are, and kid themselves on their thinking digital, when they're actually looking to transform analog services uh, simply into a digital equivalent. I mean, Chal and I, over the last few years, um, sometimes smile or despair with each other when colleagues in the NHS say that their service has gone digital. And what they mean is that they're now sending data using PDFs, um, which they print off, rescan, um, and it takes actually longer to send the data than it did when you used a letter, a stamp, and an envelope. But for us, when we talk about next generation services, we really don't talk about products. We actually want to talk about services uh, and we want to talk about enabling infrastructures. And that is really the battlefield for our next two, three, uh, five years. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means this, that we need to change the way we've been thinking about investment uh, in health and care, where most of the funding time and effort uh, has gone into treatment and post-event care with little heed paid to prevention, detection, anticipation, or even how we maintain people independently uh, in their own homes as they get older. So the key strategic vision for DHI is we spend more time and investment um, in looking at prevention, detection, uh, and independent living. And we really look to shift the balance of care. And a lot of countries around the world are actually recognizing this is what they need to do. They just are not sure uh, how to deliver that aspiration. But at the same time for us as a national innovation center, uh, we have got an economic growth and economic development uh, goal as well. Because again, as you on this call will be aware, that the greatest thing to improve the health and well-being of civic society is not investing more in the delivery of health care, um, but actually uh, it's improving uh, the overall economy and the GDP of a nation. So we have, as part of our remobilization and recovery uh, of the nation in Scotland and the UK, uh, in Scotland we call it the Health for Wealth Agenda. Uh, how we stop regarding health spend as cost, because with cost, you naturally want to try to cut it, but we look at health spend as investment and how we can actually grow the economy through investing in the provision of next generation health and care services. That's about creating opportunities for Scottish businesses to develop new uh, digital tools and services, not simply to service the needs of the citizens of Scotland, but to sell those products globally but equally importantly, to stimulate Scotland um, as a place for uh, global companies to come to do their R&D, and we can benefit um, through that. But we cannot afford to be parochial, and that is my key message for today. This needs international collaboration. This needs like-minded people to come together, to work together, to think together, to move us forward in a coherent and sensible manner. So what is our future? Well, every country, and this is the thing that irritates the hell out of me as well, if you don't mind me uh, saying so, is we're now talking about hospital without walls, as though this is absolutely transformational. And we're trying to set up hospital at home services. Wherever you go in Europe, people are talking about hospital at home. Nobody's actually thought what that means. The positive aspect of it is let's stop locking all our resources up in these institutions we call hospitals and let's make them available to the community. But that only takes us so far. We need to look at the citizen. We all say in healthcare we have to put the citizen of everything we do and that usually means involving people uh, in decisions about their health and care. But for us and what Charles is going to expose you to is our world where we basically say, what if the citizen became the point of data integration? What if we stop putting AI in the hands of organizations, institutions, and governments, and put AI in the hands of citizens to support them to curate their own data, to make better informed health and well-being decisions, to allow them to access services on their own terms, 
that would be transformational. That would mean citizens would deliver more of their own health and care without relying on the nanny state or the very expensive public services to do it for them, which is the way we've trained society uh, since the Second World War. So for us, it's not simply about sticking a, a high expensive ensuite bathroom on your bedroom and expecting when you turn the tap on that hot water is going to turn out. It is about having the boring bit sorted out, the bit behind the wall, the bit that nobody sees, the bit that very few people are interested in. It's about having that right, but recognizing you can't pull all your plumbing out and put all new plumbing in without causing major disruption and huge expense. So we have to do this recognizing legacy systems will be with us. And that's really the journey we're on. So what is it we're doing? I'm intrigued to find out. Hence the reason I'm joining you and going to listen to Chow. Chow, over to you. Thanks very much, George. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I'm just going to share my screen. Just making sure you can see that okay. Can everyone see that? Yep. Great. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> thanks very much, George, for the warm tea up. It means I can kind of jump straight into the, <clears throat> the, the, the guts of this. Um, so before I get into this, I appreciate that I'll be small on your screens right now. Um, I just want to give you a, a sense of, of, of the kind of um, overall elements we're going to talk through just now. Um, so we spent um, almost eight years now as an innovation center. Um, we spent a lot of our early um, time as an innovation center um, supporting uh, industry, um, developing digital health and care products, pushing those products, trying to commercialize them, uh, running pilots, uh, demonstrating and deploying these things in, in, in the market. So this might be things like uh, self-management ma self of diabetes applications um, or, um, you know, uh, tools to support um, breastfeeding mothers or, you know, lo lo lots of individual <coughs> um, uh, products. Uh, and we basically spent the first three years of our existence um, working on these um, and ran a lot of pilots and a lot of deployments. And um, we found that we kept hitting the same systemic barriers. Things were good in their small, isolated, um, uh, you know, pilot implementations. We can never seem to manage to scale to, to, to move something into systemic impact. Um, and these, you know, there are all sorts of reasons for that, cultural change management, um, issues with public procurement and, and, and the way we commission. Um, but one thing that came up over and over again was were, were issues around um, interoperability, integration. Um, uh, you know, the self-management diabetes app um, only went so far because it treated the patient as a, an isolated siloed part of the system where they could look at guidance, put in their own blood glucose readings, manage their diet, but their GP couldn't see that data uh, and they wouldn't act on it in a material way and it didn't in any way change the type of outpatient care they would receive or specialist clinic care they would receive other than the patient would be able to open their own app on their phone when asked questions about their recent past and have some sort of you know structure that they could use to to recount their story um so the, the system is never quite integrated and we never got into that next level where um because because that that self-management was happening we could we could key off it and use it to drive and, and pivot the way the service to, is, is delivered at any kind of scale um so we start looking at the, those systemic barriers and trying to s s fix them and, and and so dhi four or five years ago stopped trying to push different products and services and systems per se and started working on those fundamental systemic um, requirements. Um, so what I'm showing you today here is, is a piece around uh, what we call person-centered data sharing. So how can we use the citizen as an active co-manager of their data? Um, how can we put in place infrastructure that sits underneath the products and tools that they and clinical teams and care teams use? Um, and how can we use that to um, create more personalized and preventative models 
service models. So not technologies, service models, that's what we're interested in. Um, and um, how can we show more integrated care by giving the citizen the tools to integrate the different agencies and, and people that, that, that are supporting them in a way that those agencies have struggled with in the past to do on an organizational basis. Um, so that's what we're going to talk, talk to you here today about. So I'll just quickly start, uh, I guess, at the big at the beginning. So DHI is first and foremost a um, a design organization. So we're thirty people, uh, of whom uh, you know about about half are designers and uh, whole system designers and thinkers. Um, so we do a lot of co-design with citizens. So just so we're clear on what we mean by co-design, sitting in, in rooms with people, 10, 12 at a time, mixture of professionals, carers, uh, um, and, and citizens, you know, and, and the patients, um, doing, you know, learn by doing exercises, uh, creative um, uh, uh, methods that we use to help people prototype. I don't mean that necessarily in a technical sense, cardboard, Lego, uh, you know, using using those kind of play-based um, creative tools to get people to open up, talk about um, their, their challenges and talk about the kind of service they'd like to build. And we, and we do that and we, we, we basically co-produce these kind of future service models with people um, based on their assets, based on their needs, goals, desires, um, uh, to respond to those challenges and to deal with some of the pain points that are in the system at the moment. Um, and then we take, take those code design outputs and we, and we do go into a more of a digital kind of prototyping kind of space, look, talk, look at integration, look at how we, we, we move that through into deployment um, in, in, in real life. But I want to just focus on the code design element for a minute because we've done this for seven or eight years now and um, we're starting to, in our kind of meta analysis, see trends starting to emerge. Um, now, these code design exercises might be uh, again, self-management of diabetes, it might be uh, carer experiences for supporting frail or pre-frail older adults, um, supporting young mothers to breastfeed, supporting children uh, who are transitioning out of um, institutional care uh, and supporting their mental health, for example. Um, there's a whole range of thing, things um, that this, 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 this co-design portfolio does or was handled. And what we found is that the requirements are very rarely about the product or tool or interface. It's very rarely about anything, sh any of the shiny stuff that we would most normally associate with digital health and care, wearables and you know, medical devices and internet of things. That stuff doesn't tend to come into it um, as much as the more fundamental things are that are common across these, which are all about communication, relationships, trust, planning, decision making, um, these these are the kind of fundamentals that you'll see, more or less irrespective of which which of these these conditions or groups or, or cohorts you, you kind of work with. And these five elements here are, I guess, the tip of the the, the kind of iceberg, top level of a pyramid of of, of an insight that we've kind of gathered. Um, we actually have a curated list of about 24 common user requirements in a bit more detail than this. But this is this is a, th th these these are the kind of so what messages. Um, so just to quickly run through those, um, citizens are telling us that they want to tell their story once. Um, this is by far the most ubiquitous and common uh, requirement. I, I, people are growing increasingly frustrated with having to repeat themselves over and over again across different people, agencies, support groups, say it's t t telling the same story over and over again, <clears throat> be it a healthcare professional, a social care assistant, uh, uh, an ortho uh, orthopedic surgeon, uh, a benefit system, a housing uh, um, provider, whoever it may be. Um, and they're looking to, to tell that story once uh, and they're willing to curate that and, and put a bit of effort in if it means less friction and less effort later. Um, they're looking for that story to not just be about their healthcare in the in the, in the medical sense of the word, but um, they, 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 you know they, they, patients and citizens don't tend to see it in those terms. They they talk about their housing status, their employment, their uh, where their daughter and son live relative to them as, as people they depend on for for some of their well being and, and and social connectedness, their uh, diagnoses and their appointments, uh, but also the counselling and, and support they get from local charities. Um, you know, so there's a whole bundle 
of of things that make up the health and health and well-being story that aren't just about the health system um and so that story needs to be curated in a way that isn't just about the health system um they want that story to be part, used to inform a meaningful dialogue with professionals so that might um be as, sim as simple as their story including the fact they're in a wheelchair uh, and to not have the surprise you know for the institution they're visiting to find them in a wheelchair and realize that the exercise that they planned for the day with them uh, is not viable because of their of their of their status um, or it might be not taking someone through a seven appointment uh, pre-operative assessment journey only to find at the very last last stage that they won't accept a blood transfusion on religious grounds um you know these are these are things that we should and could know about people if we did more to um help them with that story and key our systems off their story rather than the other way around um <clears throat> that might include things like their goals preferences needs um so we get stories all the time uh, around the kind of you know unintended consequences of, of, of medical care um the typical one being Someone loves someone in their sixties loves gardening. Um, they uh, have knee knee pain. Uh, they end up, you know, going through a medical process and having knee surgery. They have excellent clinical outcomes from that. Their pain is gone. They got reasonable level of range of motion. Their mo mobility um, improves or stabilizes. But they can't kneel anymore, and so they can't garden. So for the patient, they are then surprised by this, and that's a bad outcome even if it's a clinically optimal outcome. Um, so our system in no way, shape or form at the moment can understand or tolerate that kind of set of priorities. And so when we talk about meaningful dialogue with professionals, we really mean you know, something as soft as saying what, what matters to you. And based on that, let's make sure that we understand some of these typical unintended consequences and make sure that we have the right kind of prompts and, and decision support systems in place when people are even deciding to go onto a surgical um, uh, uh, list in the first place, that we're not just talking about the medical component of that, uh, of that, of that surgical journey. Um, to access and understand my data and guidance is the next one. So this is, this is saying, this isn't just, can I read my clinical record? This is, can I get some sort of utility from it? Can I use my data to do things differently or, or to reduce friction or to improve my access? Um, so that might be in a typical one, um, which pairs with the, the um, unlock or unblock the care I need requirement at the bottom there is, can I take my Alzheimer's diagnosis out of the healthcare system and bring it with me to the social security system to prove I have clinical need and make it easier to get an access to a benefit? And we often get people saying to us, if I can do it with a driver's license and go into a, a car garage and buy a car and drive it away that day, um, you know how, how how does that work? Why don't they spend a month communicating back and forth between the the the, the department for vehicle registrations and 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 and, uh, uh, and and the car seller? You know um, they don't. They've given me the proof. I have a driver's license. I can go and I can show it to them. Uh, um, it gives them them their their audit trail to make sure I was safe to drive, and they give me a car. Um, you know, so clearly people are asking. You know, surely in a digital era we can do something where we can bring proof with us. Get access and, and, and service at the point of the point of, it, of, 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 of delivery rather than um, the current system which is fill a bunch of forms in uh, and then wait for the system to to do all the, the background checks and things in the background um, and then at some point in the next month to six weeks you'll you'll get some service um, and then the last two kind of pair to do things on my own terms to unlock or unblock the care I need so to do things on my own terms this might mean um, because I want more control over that story. And some of that story involves things like my past and upcoming appointments. Um, my daughter is the one that takes me to my appointments. So she needs the appointment notifications as much as I do. So I want to be able to delegate to her and give her some sort of formal role in my care and have her recognized digitally so that um, it's, not, you know, it's not just good enough that I have an appointment system that I act in in, in a silo. There's a, a number of people that I want activated as part of that. Um, it might be that I've just been diagnosed with diabetes and there's a checklist that the nursing team normally has to take you through foot exams, weight management plans and various, you know, um, um, you know checks and, and, and tests that they need to do to, 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 to stabilize that patient. Um, it might be that in this, in this new model, 
um, the checklist is shared with the patient uh, and there are a flexible number of things that the patient or the professional could do to satisfy the different elements of the checklist. I mean, the, the tests are done at a pharmacy or, or on a drop-in basis on the way home from work one day instead of necessarily having to be a, an appointment and see the GP. It might mean that um, because the patient can see that checklist and they see the, the foot exam is something that needs to happen in the first six months, and they look at it and they look at the guidance around it and they go, hold on, I didn't realize foot care was so important as a diabetic. I've got heavy bruising around my foot. Could I bring that foot exam forward? Because I think it's, it's more important now than the other things on this list. Um, whereas typically the healthcare system wouldn't necessarily be that responsive, but the citizen can flag to us, you know, on that checklist, which are the things that are, are most likely to be impactful most quickly. And then finally, that to, to, to unlock or unblock the care I need, and as we've described, that's around proof, authority, trust. Um, so if the citizen has that story, um, how can we make sure organizations and people trust it? And that will often mean that the organization, that there are some organizations that will say certain things about someone that will be trusted. If I go to a, to a, a part of, this, a, of a service, for example, social security, and say, I have Alzheimer's, that has one level of trust. If I go and say, I have Alzheimer's and the NHS agrees that I have Alzheimer's and here's my proof, then all of a sudden we're in a different place. Um, so how do we transfer that authority from the organization to the citizens so they have you know, the, the actual power in, 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 that, in that dynamic? So when we talk about co-management, we talk about empowering citizens, we don't mean in, in a kind of abstract way, we mean, we mean actually giving them authority. Um, that might mean one day that they can self-refer into different services because they can prove the need to um, instead of us gatekeeping through primary care or other systems. And that's you know, quite a challenge the way the system currently works. If you spoke, speak to most people working in IBD, uh, diabetes, asthma, um, you know, the services that, 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 that need that ongoing specialist input, they will tell you that they want to see the patient the minute that they're having an exacerbation uh, uh, or very early in that exacerbation and they don't want they don't want gatekeeping in front of that um, and, and, and in many cases they trust the patient to use them well um, in that moment and they're willing to 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 to, to, to do that so those are the kind of requirements um and just to kind of zoom out a little bit um we um we we also as part of that work map personal data items as we go. So we, we, we start to curate the kinds of data items that people tell us about as part of those journeys. What, what do they have? What do they hold? What can they provide? You know, with an increasingly connected uh, Internet of Things enabled world, more and more data sources are available. But those data sources are available to the citizen as the common component, not to health systems uh, as a default. Um, so what we've done in this diagram here is you'll see in the middle the, the middle of this is the social de determinants of health, so the things that make up your health outcomes, and obviously clinical care is only a, a, a portion of that. The outer circle is 225 different personal data items, categories that we've kind of curated over the years and that we've mapped against those social determinants. And this is just to illustrate to people the diversity of, of data items and types that could be influencing health and care. But at the moment, we tend just to focus on the blue segment around clinical care. So that might be in, in clinical care, diagnosis, test results, blood markers, um, you know, uh, patient history, comorbidities, you know, those sorts of things, personal uh, data around your individual behavior, retail habits, wearable data, Fitbit, Apple, um, uh, you know, these, these, these sorts of things. Um, physical environment might be the air quality and pollution and uh, um, uh, pollen count and various other things in your region or, or maybe even in your home with modern um, smoke and, uh, and air quality um, uh, smart home capabilities coming into place that can now, now give you a good understanding of that. And then in the social and economic sphere is probably the most important housing, housing, uh, social connectedness, um, employment status or history, uh, you know, all the kind of uh, the fabric of, of the rest of life. Um, and so we, we show this, this diagram to help people take a step back and think if you're trying to personalize and predict, then we need to stop just looking at the blue segment because our record systems for that blue segment are an episodic disease focused and reactive record. Um, that's our healthcare record primarily. Um, we need to start looking at things like someone's energy consumption 
uh, we already know from academic work in, in the UK that there, there are predictive, there's predictive power in the way someone uses energy in their own home uh, to, to, to give us early warning around pre-frailty, frailty, dementia, and other, and other elements. Um, so, you know, we, we already know that someone's in, in employment and, and, and the kind of jobs they've done over their lives will be heavily predictive of musculoskeletal pain uh, or early onset dementia or respiratory issues. Um, you know, so how do we activate more of that pie chart? Um, and I don't, I don't know about the, the culture and the political nature of <clears throat> in, in your end of things, but in the UK, the idea that the government is going to aggregate all this data is terrifying to people. The nanny state, the massive super database, you know, where they, the surveillance state, all these sorts of kind of um, thought processes. So it's not politically, culturally, ethically, or from a privacy point of view, achievable to say that either a commercial organization or a government is going to aggregate this data. And for us, the only real way to do this is to say the citizen is the only person that should should have the authority and the capability to aggregate this data if they so, so should choose um, and give them active consent control. And we need to you know, upskill them in, the, in understanding the, the nature of that and what they can do with it and what the unintended consequences of it might be. Um, because we, we, we simply don't know at this point. The chief one people normally say is, don't let the insurers see it, um, you know, because we don't know what, how that will affect your risk profile, right? <clears throat> um, uh, so, you know, we've got to be very careful around that. But the point is, the only way to do it is with the citizen as a, an active co-managing co uh, part. Um, so, just sort of zooming out a little bit, taking those um, thought processes together, so we've got this emerging context rich data environment that we're living in and it isn't just about clinical care it's about that, the, those broader broader social determinants we've got a citizen that's increasingly demanding the ability to tell their story once and wishing to be an active co-managing partner in that and just to be clear that's not everyone some people if you gave them the ability to tell their story would immediately hand that straight back to a gp and say can can i not just use my gp record as a story and that's fine um, but many people, especially people on cancer care pathways, people with multiple sclerosis, people, you know, uh, you know, newly retired and approaching uh, possibly pre-frail kind of stages. These are all the people that are, are activated because they have to be in order to navigate the system and in order to keep themselves independent and in order to maintain a quality of life. So we're really talking about the people that, 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 that you know, have you know, long-term conditions moving into complex care requirements and, you know, in, in the main here. Um, but those people are telling us that, uh, and, and just to be clear, these are the people that are also the biggest users of services um, uh, in, in that sense. Um, and these people are telling us that these are the domains that they're interested in. Um, so when they talk about their story, they're talking about their health services, their social care services, uh, the, 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 the third sector, uh, independent, you know, so broadest possible sense of services in that. Their friends and family, their informal circle of care. I might include their neighbour who gets them their milk every 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 few days and is their main social contact, for example. Um, but they're interested in their social security, so the, the benefits and other support services that, that, that they need to to, to depend on. Um, they are interested in um, their identity. How do they prove who they are? Um, it comes up a lot, uh, and then their eligibility. How can they demonstrate their need or risk? Uh, across a range of different different things. And then finally, on the left-hand side, we've got the kind of home and community piece, which is a mixture of the networks uh, and community groups and kind of um, people-powered kind of element of that community, uh, which might include like a local walking group that they join for exercise or a, or a, or a, or a counseling team that supports them. Um, uh, but also increasingly a, a, an intelligent environment and a set of internet of things capabilities that start to emerge that, that creates, creates a more data-rich home and community space and then finally the device and wearables piece which you know as we've said is not the most important thing but nonetheless people will increasingly have a wearable will increasingly have smart home technologies will increasingly have a smartphone that collects ambient data about their their mobility and other things um so that will start to to, to enrich enrich this um this model and just to illustrate i think i've got maybe 10 minutes left so i'll just illustrate a few um a few examples of how this works in practice so you know you'll look at that and say wouldn't wouldn't the world wouldn't the world be great if we could do that if we could give the citizen that power if we could give them the ability to aggregate and act to that point of integration so 
the, the, the quick answer is in Scotland, we have not done that. Just so we're crystal clear, we are on a journey towards that. <coughs> um, <coughs> the examples I can give you, we have lots of different slices of this all working towards the same goal, but from health, care, third sector, social security. So we were still, we, we, you know, Scotland still has its silos, um, but each of those groups is starting to move towards the middle here. Um, and we are starting to see a dovetailing of thought about how we create infrastructure that underpins that kind of shared model, such that the Scottish government has committed to a digital identity strategy where citizens will have one pan public sector login and one government provisioned personal data store and that personal data store the only centralized element of that will be your username and password everything else will be put into an individual personal data store for each individual and it's truly their data the reason we know that is because they can delete the entirety of it at any time now that doesn't replace your medical record and it doesn't replace your social security system and all the rest of it but what we're saying is that thing that the government is putting in place is, is saying um here is a digital identity system that doesn't centralize and create a a, a kind of nanny state capability uh, quite the opposite we want to aggregate your data to hand it to you so you control it so that we could we can't do that <laughs> so it's, it's, it's trying to put in place those those locks to make sure we can't we have started to connect health systems into that um domain into that personal data domain using what we would call a health data exchange i'm sorry i should probably be showing you what that looks like um so these are personal data stores so these are the different domains around around someone health and care systems other public services broader well-being services, consumer services, um, and, and the kind of medical device and, and, and regulated health and care kind of marketplace. Personal data stores is where we're going to store the data in this new model, that, 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 that citizen-held data store. That's not an app. That is literally just the bucket. It's a dumb bucket with APIs that the data gets put in, but it's independent from any product, service, organization, or otherwise. And then we're working chiefly at the moment on health, on health data exchange. So it actually sits the bridge between someone's personal domain, their consumer services and devices and other things. And on the other end of the bridge is their health and care systems. And so this health data exchange is a consent based digital switchboard with clinical teams sat at one end, patient sat at the other, with the patient having one login and the ability across many different services to consent to share data or consent to reshare data that they've already created uh, in the past. And so just to kind of illustrate that health data exchange um, in, in use. Um, so our, our, um, uh, one of our first projects around this was a project called Dynamic Scott. This is for high-end people, people with high-end COPD needs. So um, chronic respiratory uh, uh, needs, uh, trying to keep independent in the community. So the way this works is the person brings their wearable and their home ventilator and so in this case it's a resmed home ventilator and a fitbit um, they can connect that into the exchange um, they can link the accounts that they would have for these consumer services into their nhs identity um, they have an app that the nhs provides where they can enter proms and prems data so a patient reported outcome and experience measures around fatigue shortness of breath pain and other kind of qualitative elements and that combination of data can be consented by the citizen into the, the system through this health data exchange. Um, and the, on the clinical side, uh, that health data exchange connects into hospital systems, GP systems, labs, hospital pharmacy and others. So we bring in appointments data, um, uh, uh, comorbidities, diagnosis, patient history, treatment plans, uh, um, test results, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, and all of that data from both the clinical domain and the personal domain on a consented basis is aggregated and visualized to the COPD team. So that COPD team now has all of their normal data that they would typically have to run around lots of different systems to find in one place. And then it's supplemented by a drumbeat from the citizen. Every couple of days, they put in a bit of, a bit of scoring around their, their pain and their outcomes and how, how they're progressing along with their physical activity, mobility, sleep, breathing, 
how often they're on, on home ventilation, how well it's working for them, et cetera. Um, and so far, this is actually out of date slide, we're now looking at, because there's this co-management, there's two-way messaging built into the system, the COPD team has completely reoriented the way it works into this model of an ongoing dialogue-based asynchronous interaction. We're now seeing a 40% reduction in admissions to hospital, an 88% reduction in occupied bed days, and a 60% reduction in community respiratory appointments. Now, everyone always focuses on the admissions and says, wow, that's great. But the most important bit is the 60% reduction in community respiratory appointments. You don't need appointments to manage clinical risk if you're always managing clinical risk because the citizen is co-managing and, 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 and working with you because they're co-managing that data, they trust in the system and you, they're, they're participating in that dialogue, which means you have a continuous idea of need, which means you have an early understanding of when they're likely to exacerbate. As you would expect in this model, with you know spending a lot of time working on machine learning algorithms to start automating out that that um, risk stratification and, and be able to identify those people earlier and earlier and earlier um, in, in that process. So that's one example. Uh, I, I won't bore you with, with, with the details of others, but if you want to follow up, we can definitely go into nitty gritty. But we're doing similar for dermatology, um, heart failure, pain management, gastroenterology, and, and others. Um, our, our big stress test is that infrastructure is being used for our COVID. Um, test and protect system. So all test results are being pushed out through this infrastructure and all contact tracing is being done through it as well. Um, so in Scotland, citizens through consented common infrastructure are contact tracing themselves in 64% of all cases. Um, so professionals aren't phoning them and going through forms with them and filling in and going through that citizens are doing themselves using their own tools uh, and that being consented straight into surveillance systems. And the benefit of that is in 75% of cases, they're doing this within 45 minutes of receiving their positive test result. Right. Whereas our phone based systems were getting them maybe 24 to 48 hours after their test result. And as we know, speed is everything with contact tracing. Um, so the data is probably not as high quality if it, as, as if a trained uh, contact tracer was, was helping them through it, but um, um, we're getting 80% of what we need and we're getting it within 45 minutes. So the, this is the power of that co-management of data where we basically trust the citizen and they're, they're part of the team and, and they have that consent and control. I'll just maybe touch on one more one more kind of example. So those are the examples that were kind of very um, NHS focused, very health, health system focused. So maybe I'll just quickly touch on something around um, kind of co-managed cancer, cancer care planning. So in this exercise, we showed how um, we would connect a person personally held record app, so PHR app, so a kind of multi-morbidity, complex care kind of user interface. Um, we'd connect it to a clinical data repository in the NHS. Um, we connected connect it to something called Midex, which is a personal data store provider that we're, we're, we're working with. The CDR is the single source of clinical truth. The personal data store is the single source of personal truth. And in some cases, there's overlap. But in most cases, they're just in, they just enrich each other because one is highly trusted, clinically endorsed, um, and, and very, very factual and to the point. The other one is more experiential, uh, uh, more context-rich, less trustworthy in, in, in the broader range because there's a mix of data in there and, it's, and the provenance isn't always clear. Um, but when you fuse those two things together, interesting things are possible. So in this model, so this is this is um, uh, starting to go live in Glasgow um, with that personal data store now being rolled out. What you're basically seeing is that the patient is onboarding, um, they are consenting, they're curating a circle of care, which is a mixture of people, groups, and services through directory lookups and invitations. They're starting to put in that problems and premise data, that regular drumbeat of how am I doing? Let's build up that profile, let's start that dialogue and, and start and start understanding how, how, how I'm progressing over time. So this might be someone on cancer care pathway going through chemo, for example. Um, they are able to, for the first time, see a timeline that unifies the way the charity, which is Macmillan Cancer Care, that does a lot of their psychosocial and link worker and other support work, all the stuff they do, plus all the stuff their oncologist is doing and all the stuff their broader um, clinical team are doing, they can see all that stuff in one place because what's happening here is 
the clinical elements are coming to them and being made visible and interactable from the clinical data repository. And the, the work that the charity does, Macmillan, is they, they have access to the personal data store in a way that they wouldn't normally have access to the clinical record. So they're able to contribute to the citizens side of things. Um, and that starts to build up that joint picture. Macmillan does hol hol holistic needs assessment and that data is stored in the personal data store, but is also shareable into the clinical record and vice versa. And the reason that's important is because the PROMS and PREMS data that they're curating for the oncology team um, is quite similar to the holistic needs assessment data that the charities and other agencies are creating to understand their broader needs and support them with housing and various other things. So we're starting to see the idea of a holistic needs assessment becoming less of a thing that you do once every so often and more of a thing that you do organically through dialogue on an ongoing basis. You're curating it over time together and multiple, multiple bits of the team, on oncologists, the nursing team, the charity are all contributing to that common understanding of that rolling holistic needs assessment. And then I guess we've got things like respect plans, so anticipatory care plans. So instead of that being locked away in a GP system and the patient maybe being given a paper copy, giving them electronic access to their anticipatory care plan and the ability to review it and, and request changes to it. And then lastly, and this is the reason we did this project in the first place, you start linking these worlds, we can start creating dynamic personal care plans. So not organizational care plans, personal care plans. And so we've used pet care as an example, because it's something that is typically not well handled by core health systems. Um, this person lives alone. They have a dog. <clears throat> when they go into chemo, their neighbor comes and walks the dog. They have that agreement in place already. This plan says, if my place of care changes, because the clinical data repository has said I've been admitted. And so we know I'm no longer at home. Let Julie next door know. So Julie gets a notification saying, um, you know, Jim is, has, is, has gone into hospital. Julie knows that now she needs to, for a limited period of time, come in and walk the dog and feed the dog every day. And the confidence that gives the patient, you wouldn't believe, I'm not sure if anyone's ever experienced this before, but we used to work, I used to work for the ambulance service. Paramedics will tell you one of the hardest things to do is get someone who's living on their own out and into hospital when they need to, if they've got a pet, what do you do with the pet? It is actually a, a, a big deal. And then the other, th other more typical things, things like I would like to automatically notify my charity worker if I've been admitted. So it's not the, it's not the healthcare system's job to do that. It's the, but the citizen can make it happen and they can make it happen on an automated basis. So you can create these plans that aren't just about the way they they relate to an onco oncologist and do not resuscitate orders and the medical legal as aspects, but we can start creating these interesting dynamic things where we talk about how we knit the community and their informal circles of care together and their charity workers and other people into help them with the non-medical bits when that plan needs to enact. I think I've probably done enough for today, so hopefully I'll, I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. That was uh, amazing and uh, more revolutionary and, uh, uh, than I would have anticipated at, at the beginning for, for shaking things up. Um, before kind of turn to any uh, questions in the, in the chat, I did, you did say that you wanted to uh, uh, see how we could um, facilitate future collaborations. So, and I didn't want that to get left behind if we run out of time. So. Uh, what are the opportunities you're, you're perhaps imagining for uh, collaborations? So um, I, I guess from our point of view, we run uh, a lot of sandbox and simulation, yeah, simulation work, work where we um, use fake data, real systems to experiment and support knowledge exchange and co-design. There's absolutely no reason why anyone else from anywhere in the world couldn't participate in those sandboxes with us if you wanted to learn by doing. Um, we can walk you through how we would do it, but that's not necessarily the way to do it. Often just having a different locus of power by having new infrastructure that isn't necessarily controlled by the health system, you'll find that new service models start to pop up into people's heads that new, new, new possibilities emerge. So um, our, our normal offer to people is come and play. You know, come and play. Let, let you know. Uh, you know, you, you might have a project that's underway that you think would 
would would benefit from you know what would the world look like if we plopped a personal data store into that integrated care project around frailty you know um you know let's 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 do it um doesn't necessarily mean you're going to use our technology because obviously we're in, we're over here and you're over there but you you know we could definitely show you how we specified that technology and how we enacted it and i'm sure you'll have local equivalents that that, that could be um built or or, or commissioned um but but first people need to know to ask if that makes sense so there's an art of the possible thing here so that, that's our kind of strong space if you if people want to participate in that kind of joint um what if yeah just just two seconds and i'll let come in i mean see certainly from my point of view the other thing and child men just mentioned it, it's been underpinning everything we've said is this issue about trust um and you know, at the end of the day, so this is all about culture. This is not about technology, actually. And as, as everyone on this call knows, being a prophet in your own land is a really tough job. Uh, and therefore, getting, getting international collaborators, uh, getting people who actually say exactly the same thing as you do, but because they're saying it coming from somewhere else, it has a, an extra level of gravitas and credibility uh, than it does coming from us in Scotland. That kind of thing helps as well. So there, there are different levels and different ways of slicing collaboration going forward. Sorry, Dougie, I talked over you. Uh, thanks very much. And it's, it's, it's great to see what's going on in, in Scotland there. Um, here's me, of course, with my Scottish accent. I'm very jealous in many ways. And, but you're right, yeah, sometimes being a prophet in your own country is a, uh, that you're working in is a bit of a challenge. Um, the, the pod work, the, you know, the, the, the personal data store uh, is something I've had an interest in for a long time. Of course, the Tim Berners-Lee was advancing that, so I don't know if it's based on the same sort of thing, uh, sh shaking your head. Uh, it, um, it, 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 it's, it's conceptually the same thing. It's a, it, 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 a different technology, but frankly, I don't think the technology matters. It's the principle. It's Does, does the citizen have full active consent control? Is it independent right. of the health care organisation? That's the important thing. Yeah, well, interestingly, though, um, I mean, it's great to see how far you've actually got with the implementation, because I think the concept and the, the it is really key. You know, I've been trying to work around this idea, I've been calling it My Health Village uh, for a, a few years, and I've been working a bit on the health data exchange. In other words, the, the ability to at least connect the components um, uh, but I think it would be really interesting to see if we could use these sandboxes around the, around the, you know, that patient ownership around the data. We just don't have that infrastructure, and it'd be really amazing to actually start trying to think along these these directions and sort of incorporating that with some of the technologies that we're trying to build that try and support the sort of integrations you're doing. Um, yeah. and, and, and just to be clear, four years ago, we didn't have any, anything, you know, so, so, you know, and, you know, so I think each economy is going to have to go on its own journey around that. But, you know, we can, we can definitely accelerate each other by sharing, sharing, sharing knowledge. I'm going to take a question from the chat um, before we go to Mark. Uh, so, so Kath uh, Feely posted, um, how will or do you include citizens who do not speak English to interact with their health data? That's similar to a question I wrote down. You, you talked about making the data useful or actionable um, uh, to the person. What steps do you take, if any, to facilitate kind of, you know, translation from medical ease to, to common, you know, to, a, the citizens, you know, citizens language of choice, say. Yeah, in, <clears throat> interesting question so so i mean the, 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 the language one i guess it depends um at a at a fundamental plumbing level it's all it's all mono language um individual services that connect <clears throat> depending on need will then you know have different language modes and, and and other things um to an extent we're locked in to english being used in every core hospital system so it's very difficult to then all of a sudden change the paradigm as we translate that out into 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 the citizens world um uh so yes unfortunately you know we're, we're stuck with that that on a service by service basis um so you'll find things like contact tracing for example 
absolutely does it across a range of languages because that was seen as fundamental to you know helping kind of harder to reach groups participate in in in, in that COVID response. Um, the patient language piece is an interesting one. Um, a lot of the resistance from our clinical colleagues has often been that they don't want to give patients access to things like test results without the professional in the room, as it were. Um, feeling like that 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 medical language is going to stress stress them out and, and cause concern and cause them to to um, do, do things. Um, and we've demonstrated through a number of studies that that is just simply not true. Um, if you layer in, uh, if you nest the the guidance and evidence correctly and you say here is the result here is the simple version of what that means so some sort of interpretation here is the more complicated version of what that means and here is the here's the academic journal go and read for yourself this you know here's the evidence as to why we would advise you to do this instead of that and people will read to that will read will, will go down the, the the tier and they'll read to the level of to which they're they're, they're comfortable reading and we've had universal universally positive reaction to that from citizens point of view because from their point of view they're saying if i could have the test results the day after instead of three weeks later that is the biggest win because then i know it doesn't matter what it is i know and i'm not sat there waiting three weeks you know till my next appointment or wherever it may be um so i guess there's a language so, so, so brian to your language point it's it's um yes they do want to use their own language sometimes but actually they will very easily accommodate, it, you know, if you get the user interfaces right, and and they and they and, and they're capable of handling handling the the, the the language we use. I guess the other point. Uh, Charles, oh, sorry, I was just going to to add to that. I mean, I guess the other point there is that we're getting into discussions at the moment in Scotland about the digital front door, um, to to health and care, and um, we've been really worried that this this to a lot of people means you're the Amazon version of it. You put a very, very slick, dependent, creating, uh, big, attractive uh, front door that everybody has to go through the one. Um, the beauty of all of the ICT design that we're, we're, we're exposing you to just now is that you have a single common scheduling system for appointments, but you can have many different um, ways of accessing that scheduling system. So it can be based uh, on uh, specific requirements of hard to reach communities, languages, the look and feel can be completely different, but the back end scheduling is, is the single point. And we thought this was a bit of a no brainer. Well, I thought this was a bit of a no brainer that everybody would actually get that was a sensible thing to do. But Chal exposed me to the real world and we've just uh, hit it again just the other week where lots of people are just so naive. It's because they don't know the art of the possible. I think that's the thing. We're so used to, to, to appointment systems being everything to do with appointments. Here is, you have, you have to log in here, you have to go to this interface, this is the only way you can consume the information, and then it connects to an appointment system that makes it, makes it happen in our systems. The reality is we can separate all those components out and we can have consistency of system, but diversity of experience. Right, Mark? Yeah, look, George and Charlie, you've mentioned both trust and culture change. And I guess we all recognise as clinicians, those who are, that actually it's hardest on the clinician side. But I guess I'd be interested in your experience, so particularly the use of the personal data pool, um, what the acceptance has been like of people taking charge of having those data pools available and these methods of connection available to them. Obviously, it's a journey, a learning journey and they have multiple opportunities to do that in any other domain, not health, e.g. banking, finance, et cetera. So, and COVID's been a rusher of all this. So what has your been experience of people in terms of the uptake and their acceptance, particularly older folks since I'm a geriatrician? Yeah, um, so, the, um, so in terms of the uptake, both on the clinical side, the patient side, and the overall system acceptance, if I can put it like that, <clears throat> um, we started this journey with a personal data store and people just didn't get it. They, it was too abstract. It was, if you do this, then we can create these later. You'll get these efficiencies. You'll get these, these, these benefits for not having to repeat yourself, etc. The system didn't get it. 
it seemed superfluous to begin you got a medical record um uh, professionals didn't get it because it just created all sorts of trust you know uh, and uh, issues um and um so we that's why we started work on the health data exchange the health data exchange is almost like a bridge between the worlds um where we're, what we're basically saying is the clinician gets a more ongoing steady state uh, context rich understanding of what's going on so that each appointment that does need to happen they're not walking in going god what am i, what am I going to walk into they, they 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 have they have the they have a pretty up-to-date account of what the patient is going through the um system gets appointment length reduction and admission reduction and you know there's transactional benefits to doing it so all of a sudden there's a value in the citizen having a more active role rather than it just being a nice to have it's it's a it's a it's a business function now it's we we can't go back to dermatology appointments that that last 30 minutes and happen every three months because it was but there were bad outcomes and the system was under strain but now but now at five minutes per interaction proactive intervention ongoing dialogue and nipping the the, the risks in the bud so the system is it tolerates it much better because they see the, the benefits of that bridge and then from the citizen's point of view they don't have to go into an appointment in orthopedics to bend their knee for the surgeon they can take a short video clip of bending their knee at home submit it and then eight to 24 hours later they get a thumbs up effectively from the clinician that says everything's going well we'll check in in three weeks um you know uh and so from the citizen's point of view it's 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 i i dare i say we are relatively shallow creatures we want convenience we want friction reduction this is the way digital has transformed every other bit of our lives i didn't think my dad could do it at the age of 70 but he's online banking he's what he's streaming cricket on his ipad you know people will do it but you've got to make it desirable and the thing that's desirable in their case is not having to pop into hospital every two or three weeks for their, their long-term condition management be able to feel like they're more in control um be able to feel like they can talk to the clinical team when they need to not when they're scheduled to um you know so you know, that's that's the thing that people respond to uh, and people have been you know incredibly capable when the incentive was there <laughs> um if, if that makes sense in terms of yeah will I mean, people oh. sorry will people yeah, sign up to a personal <laughs> data, will people sign up to a personal data store raw on the principle that they're going to co-manage their own data no because that's 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 too big a leap will they sidestep into it because it's improving lots of interactions for them and then one day they're doing it yes um but it's not a big bang thing you don't just switch it on and people go and do it it's it, it, there needs to be a, 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 a tangible benefit sorry fine yeah i think as your answer uh was was implying and george uh uh brought up in the chat this depends on having the reimbursement model aligned um and i think that is uh a, a, doesn't seem like australia's reimbursement model is, is aligned quite right to uh to get that um gonna take at least one more question that um natalie thorne uh, posted because it kind of touches on a couple of talks, things you haven't talked about. One, and one is DNA um, and genetic results. And the other is, um, is, there an, is there a mechanism within your system for patients consenting to uh, participate in research? Um, yep, yeah, so um, we are absolutely nowhere near time having a conversation about DNA. And, and genetic results we're still in the tug of war of convincing people to let the diagnosis go <laughs> as in <laughs> let the citizen take take that you know because it's such a fundamental um uh, asset to have that proof of diagnosis for all sorts of other systems so we're focusing on relatively bread and butter stuff at the moment because you know so, you know i'm painting i'm painting you a picture saying we're on a journey here we're still in the very early up upslope i suspect that, that the, the dna genetic sequence one is going to be a that's going to be a doozy when we when we when we do get there. Um, uh, um, so apologies, I can't I can't give you any anything meaningful to say around that other than um, you know uh, we're we're taking smaller bites from that at the moment. Let's put it that way. Um, uh, sorry, what was the second uh, 
question. It was uh, whether there was a mechanism in place for um, patients research. to identify research projects they would like to share their data with. So, so, so in this model, at any point, people are using a COPD application or a dermatology application or whatever the, the Connect Fitbit that they're using whatever app they want to use to to, to interact with the service in question. Any time they can go into their um, their personal data dashboard, if you like, and on that dashboard they will have um all of the services that are connected and that they can revoke access to at any time so so that they can they can they, they can see who they've consented with and they can and they can manage that if they want to very few people do but but it's there and that's important and equally um there's a prospective connections tab and in that tab it, it's where they can go through discovery so they can see by the way you can connect your fitbit or apple health kit or google fit or a resume home ventilator or a dermatologist you know so yeah, here's the the, it's not quite the marketplace because it's not commercialized, but it's here's all the things that the health and care system has allowed to connect to the infrastructure. And you can click on the buttons and go through a consenting journey to connect your version of that if you want to. So um, as part of that, for example, for COVID, we have a, a, a tile on there that says long COVID research. Connect here, go through the consenting process and your proms and prems data and your contact tracing data from your COVID records will be shared into into this study uh, with Glasgow University and you can also tick this box which will consent for your name and details to be sent to the researchers because they might want to come and interview um, so yes so that, so a, a large point of the infrastructure is to blur the lines it doesn't matter what the use case is it could be research it could be live service it could be anything as long as there's a a, a trust framework as long as there's a consent decision and as long as the citizen um, is given agency o over that and understands why and, and for who and when. Um, so yes, research for us is just another, you know, just another node in the network. Yeah. And if I can ask a follow up, um, you you talked about the difficulty of just getting the diagnosis released. What's the, and this is kind of field wide. I just learned about the no information blocking rules in the U.S. that the uh, off the ONC just issued that you can't block the release of any information to the patient portal. And what's the um, what's the legal uh, kind of framework that you're operating under in terms of the pa patient access or, or patient uh, non-access to yep. the, so, the clinical data? So GDPR um, means that um, core medical data is handled under a separate legal basis. So it's not subject to active consent control by the citizen, um, whereas other data that's health relevant, like your Fitbit data is, for example. So if, if it's regarded to be core medical, i.e. it's in your clinical record, and there's some sort of public interest in that data being curated there for public health or safety or uh, other reasons, that's that's kind of protected and basically citizens don't have the same level of uh, of control over it they would in, in, in most other cases. That said, politically, culturally, people can put in subject access requests whenever they want, and the NHS does honor that, and within a month, you, you, you'll get you'll get a very large data dump that says here's here's your information that is not particularly useful, uh, it, you know, and a lot of it might be PDFs, um, uh, but but uh, yes, people will, will give give it on a on a regular regularity compl regulate or regulation compliance basis. But but what we're saying is, you know, we need to move from that to machine readable, structured, systematic access. So that when you get it, you can do something with it. Because if all I get is a PDF, I'm then doomed to take that PDF with me wherever I go. And there's just there's no possibility of automation or ease of use elsewhere in the journey. So so for us, yes, you can, but no one has yet, and this is what we're trying to do, operationalize it. So it's just a a, a, a part of the infrastructure. Um, that you can get a, a, a reusable piece of data. I mean, we all understand that, uh, you know, as, as we keep saying, this is, this is a journey, but for those of you who are following the, the convoluted twists and turns of the European health data space, it is interesting that the big institutions are finally realising that they actually have to pay attention to this and get on the front foot and understand that you have to actually start to not only just have a dialogue, but you have to try to look how you standardize behavior towards this across international borders, because 
citizens um, and the way we live our lives um, are not constrained. It's a bit strange saying this to colleagues in Australia at this moment in time, <laughs> constrained by national uh, national borders, uh, should I say international borders. Um, and certainly um, this needs to be worked out in fairly short order. And at least there are institutions who are now planning um, to identify the questions that need answered um, and uh, starting to have those interesting uh, dialogues. So I'm kind of a glass half full person. I'm at least more, more positive that we're going to get somewhere this time um, than, than in the past, but we've got a long way to go yet. Well, thank you uh, for joining us. I'm looking forward to figuring out how I'm going to be collaborating with you in the future because